Okay, good morning Term 1E. This is a video to go over uh, the practice questions I set on the distance time graph uh, lesson and the velocity time graph and acceleration lesson. So uh, I set three practice questions. They're both um, from relatively low demand, so fairly easier ones, and a couple of medium demand questions. So it's really just getting the basics really. And um, what I'm hoping to get across to you is that it's really important to check um, to check your answers and not to get too sloppy. So uh, I, I've put in a few silly sloppy mistakes, which are quite common, which I'd like you to try and avoid. Okay, and uh, we'll be talking about you know sensible ways to improve your graphical work as you go through, um, so you can make sure that you're not one of the ones who drop silly marks. Okay. So, um, as always, um, try to um, correct yourself using a different color pen, preferably um, green if you've got it. Um, and also, as we flick to the mark scheme, don't forget to press pause um, so you can mark yourself um, and add in um, other detail as you go. So, if you, for example, in some of the written questions, if you've missed detail out, um, as this candidate did, um, then um, adding in um, information will help you learn from the mark schemes. Okay, so question number one, a horse rider, a horse and rider take part in a long distance race. The graph uh, shows how far the horse and rider travel along the race. So really important to know what we're looking at. We're looking at a distance time graph. Time always goes along the x-axis and here we've got a distance on the y-axis. So we've got to use the distance time graph rules. And distance is given in kilometers and time is in hours. So the distance of the race, um, so the candidate has got the right answer, it's 60 kilometers, and really they should have drawn a line from where my mouse is to finish with their ruler across to the 60 there. All right, so they've been a bit sloppy, but they've got away with it. Um, you definitely need to remember a ruler in your physics exams so you can do your graphical work properly. So 60 kilometers was the answer to the first one. How long did it take the horse and rider to complete the race? So what was, where did the line stop in terms of time? So this candidate has said six hours. So they've messed up and they've just looked at the, um, the number six here and they thought, oh, it must be six. But the mistake here is you can see the line doesn't stop at six. It actually stops at five and a half. So what I would expect the candidate to do is to have drawn uh, a line with a ruler so it intersects with the x-axis where my mouse pointer is there and to write five and a half there. So um, it's five and a half hours and the reason why they've lost marks it was a careless read off. So how examiners mark they put a circle around the score if they've got it the candidate and if they haven't they put a strike through it what distance did the horse and rider travel in the first two hours of the race so the candidate has done better here so um, they've gone across using a ruler and they've intersected the y-axis and you need to be ac accurate to the nearest small square all right so if you're if you're intersecting closer to the wrong line on either of your axes you lose marks so 30 kilometers was the answer there they gave you the unit so just writing 30 was good enough in this case part d how long did the horse and rider stop and rest during the race so this candidate has said half an hour so remember if if you're stopped on a distance time graph that's represented by a flat flat section so um how long was the graph flat for the candidates done better there they've read off using a ruler from two and a half to three hours so that's half an hour so not counting the time it was resting between which two points was the horse traveling the slowest give a reason for your answer so um, the right answer was between d and e and the explanation is that you can see that the gradient, the slope of the graph, the gradient, is the least great. So it's a, it's the smallest gradient, um, and obviously gradient represents speed on a distance time graph. So um, 
let's just flick to the answers. So 60 was A, one and a, uh, five and a half was B, uh, hours was needed as well. If you didn't get hours, you lost a mark. 30 um, for C, 30 minutes or half an hour must include a unit. So if you miss the unit again, um, you lost marks. And I can't reinforce enough. After you finish an e a physics exam, go back, check your calculations, check that you've got firstly a unit there and secondly that it's the right unit um, and part E, D and E as I said um, least steep part of the graph All right. Um, so um, let's progress on to the second question so question uh, number two the distance time graph represents the motion of a car during a race Describe the motion of a car between point A and point D. You should not carry out any calculations. So basically that's telling me if I start working out gradients now, I'm wasting my time. There's no credit for it. So this candidate said section A to B and B to C and C to D all were at constant velocities. Um, the car sped up between B and C compared to its speed between A and B and the car travelled slower between C and D than it did between B and C. Okay, so the first mistake this candidate has made is that they've talked about velocity. So velocity is actually the change in displacement divided by the change in time, whereas speed is the change in distance divided by the change in time. So that was actually, um, that was actually a really careless little slip um, so on the mark scheme, if we have a look, saying that they're all at a constant velocity, you can see that actually speed is un underlined in the mark scheme. So they would have lost a mark there, the candidate, because they've, they've started talking about velocity when they should have been talking about speed. So they would have lost a mark. The person was right in saying that all the speeds were constant, or what they were trying to say, all right, um, because they're all straight lines, um, which are going upwards to the right on a distance time graph. So that's a shame for the candidates. Um, in terms of speeding up f between B and C compared to A and B, and then slowing it down again when it got to C and D, that was okay. So you can see that it it sped up as it went to B and C, and then it went to a lower constant speed between C and D, um, which was fine. What so that would have got them some credit, um, and we're we're looking for max uh, two there. So they would have got one mark for that. Um, What they haven't mentioned is if the if the the um the car gets faster after it gets to B, then it must have accelerated there. So at B it must be accelerating uh, and getting faster in that case. And if it goes slower between C and D compared to B and C, it must be changing velocity again at that point and that is another example of acceleration so slowing down is just another example of acceleration but sometimes we say it's negative acceleration all right you probably would get away with saying deceleration but i would strongly encourage you to use the phrase negative acceleration so you can see um, we've added in the bits about acceleration that we didn't uh, get in the answer so that would have been good to mention so how much would the person have got there so the person would have got well there's a there's a mark for written communication so the person has used um, bullet points I really really recommend that format for written responses so there's nothing wrong with a written communication. They'd get a mark for that. I must stress that in our current specification, as long as the examiner can read the logic 
um, of what you've written and they can follow the science that's there the quality of written communication is not judged further than that okay obviously it makes a good impression if you don't waste any words and everything is concise and and the meaning is clear and there's no problems all right so that that makes it easier for the examiners to um, to to um, see where to give you marks um, okay so the gradient is the change in distance divided by the change in time and it's asking you to find out the gradient of the graph between B and C and to show clearly how you got that answer so first thing that was done is to put down the gradient is the change in distance so delta distance and delta is the, the triangle shaped symbol it's a Greek letter delta divided by delta time and then the candidate actually should have drawn a gradient triangle so I've tried to show that in red going from here with a ruler and across there with a ruler and you can see that between B and C the change in distance well it finished at 350 and it started at 100 so the change in distance um, is 250 meters and the change in time well it finished at six, uh, seven seconds excuse me and it started at three seconds so the change in time is four seconds so it's really good practice to draw a gradient triangle in fact it's, it's necessary for the marks here to draw a gradient triangle and to put um, information on the relevant parts of the graph so the change in distance was 250 meters divided by four seconds and what the candidate did then is they got lazy and they did it in their head and they did try to do 250 divided by four in their head and they got the wrong answer so if you did that calculation using a calculator you should have got 62.5 and distance is measured in meters and time is measured in seconds so the unit would be um, in meters per second all right so that's a speed in this case so let's have a look at the mark scheme so 62.5 um, would get you three marks so if you'd have rounded it up to 63 that's saying accept an answer of two significant figures so if you've drawn a gradient triangle or use two correct read-offs like I did you would get one mark um, and if you've if you've shown some understanding of gradient being X divided uh, sorry Y divided by X there was a mark in there for that so I reckon I would have got two marks for that um, I would have got away even though I didn't draw a gradient triangle originally I would have got away because of my read-offs were correct using my lines but please do draw a gradient triangle a triangle underneath the line whose gradient that you're trying to determine and one point for for my having put down the full gradient equation so I'd have got two and that was really sloppy um, of me not to use a calculator so it's just a silly needless slip which has cost me a mark um, so checking is vital um, okay um, let's go to the next question and let's go on my one so the graph shows how the velocity of a cyclist changes with time so now we've got a velocity time graph so we have to use the velo um, rules for a velocity time graph and um, not muddle it up with the rules for distance time graph so uh, part one complete the following sentence the velocity includes both the speed and direction of a cyclist so that's fine all right so you should have got that from a couple of lessons ago why has the data for the cyclist been shown as a line graph instead of a bar uh, chart so here we have a line graph because we have two continuous variables variables my variables are velocity and time and each one of those um, are measured by numbers and any number can be acceptable so 
I could say, well, what's the situation after 10 seconds? And I read it off and I've got 7.4 meters per second. Um, or I could say, well, what was um, the velocity after uh, 20 seconds? It's 9 meters per second. So it's not restricted at all. And um, I can read off any number um, that um, I can accurately see on lines of the graph. And if I need to go between the lines, I would I would have to kind of judge where to draw my line. But my, the point here is we have two continuous variables. So both velocity and time take numbers, and those numbers are not restricted in their values. Um, so whenever you have two continuous variables, um, you need to use a line graph. Um, you use bar charts if you have a categoric variable. So like... Um, if I was doing a survey on, um, you know, people's favorite foods, you know, uh, one category of foods might be snacks. One category of food might be um, takeaways. One, uh, one category of food, um, I don't know, might be desserts. So, uh, you know, uh, here I'm not dealing with categories. So categoric variables um, should be represented as bar charts um, and that's not the case here so part three the, the diagrams show the horizontal forces acting on the cyclist at three different speeds the length uh, of an arrow represents the size of the force so we've got a b and c um, they're just fallen over the page these force arrows are drawn incredibly badly okay so you sh you know you are not expected to draw force arrows starting from nowhere all right, so that's poor. Um, it's an old exam question and quite sloppy. Which one of the diagrams A, B, or C represents the forces acting when the cyclist is traveling at a constant speed of nine meters per second? So the answer to this one is C. Um, and it's C because you have force arrows that are, that are equal in length, which means the magnitude, the amount of newtons that you have for each arrow is the same. But the direction of the forces are opposite. Um, and that is always the case when you have um, a constant velocity. We say the forces are balanced and there is no acceleration. So the cyclist, if they're cycling along at 9 meters per second, they won't accelerate faster than that or they won't have any negative um, acceleration and end up going at a slower velocity. They'll stay at that constant um, 9 meters per second velocity. So again, I've used my bullet points. Explain the reason for your choice. So, uh, there is no resultant force because the arrows are equal in size and opposite in direction. And that's really important that you say equal in size and opposite in direction. If you say equal and opposite, you you are likely to lose marks because it shows that you're you're not really knowing what things must be equal and what things must be opposite. So if you have no resultant force, that is because uh, the forces are um, if you only have two of them are equal in size and and um, opposite in direction so please make sure that phrase sticks um, a bit of a slip here which didn't end up costing um, me but I talked about a constant speed of nine meters per second really um, I should have been using the word velocity okay because we do know which way um, this this person is traveling this person is traveling forwards so the direction is known so I can say that we have um, a velocity of nine meters per second in the forward direction so when there's no resultant force there is no acceleration so that's a really key point I can't stress enough whenever you have um, a balanced situation you have zero resultant force and the consequence of that is that you have no acceleration so if that an object is at rest it will stay at rest and if an object is moving at a constant velocity it will just continue to be moving at that velocity until 
um, another force acts or one of the forces changes in some way. So, um, just the mark scheme. So C was the right answer. Put briefly, velocity is not changing. Forces must be balanced. Um, it did let me off. So it did let me off and accepted in that case speed for velocity. So I got away with that, but it you know it was a bit sloppy. Forces must be balanced or resultant force is zero. So th these are all phrases that I've used. Okay. Um, good. So the final question then, the graph shows the speed of a runner during an indoor 60 meters race. Um, we've got a speed against time graph here. Now, this is very interesting. So if you're given a speed against time graph, um, what that's showing you is it's showing the magnitude of velocity. So the size of the velocity. But what the actual lines on the graph do, so you see we've got here at A one uphill line and here at C one downhill line, that actually indicates to the person um, looking at the graph the direction that the runner is running in. So usually a, uh, a positive gradient would be away from the starting point and a negative gradient usually would be uh, back towards the starting point. So we are using, we have in effect there, we have the, the speed being told to us and the direction being indicated to us. And so we have, in essence, a velocity time graph. All right. So we're using the rules again for velocity time graphs. So put the words in the gaps, given some words and phrases. Part A of the graph shows the runner is speeding up. OK, so the, the speed is going higher and higher. Um, part B. Well, it's the speed is staying at 10 meters per second, so it's moving at a steady speed, not getting faster or slower. And then part C, the runner is slowing down. You can see that it's going to, uh, to um, smaller and smaller speeds. So, um, calculate the acceleration of the runner during the first four seconds. So what that's asking us to do is to work out the gradient of the line here. So what the candidate hasn't done is they haven't drawn a triangle underneath that line, which would have been best practice. So we need to draw our gradient triangles in. Acceleration is always the change in velocity divided by the change in time, which is always V minus U over T, uh, or delta T, the change in time. V is the final velocity, U is the initial velocity, and T is the change in time. So you can see that the the section finishes at 10 meters uh, per second and it starts off at 0 meters per second and the time finishes up at 4 and it starts at 0 so um, I've put in my numbers and I've ended up getting 10 divided by 4 10 minus 0 is 10 4 stays unchanged so you know that's 2.5 and there's no unit here so when you divide meters per second when you divide it by seconds again, you get meters per second squared. And we write that m slash s squared. And the slash means you've divided meters by seconds squared. Okie doke. So I hope this uh, is helpful. And contact me by email, uh, via email, excuse me, if you're unsure of anything. Thank you very much.